This video is brought to you by Skillshare. Get a two months free trial by clicking the link in the video description. All right, gang, whiplash. And the Oscar goes to... Tom Cross, Whiplash. This is the first Oscar and nomination for Tom... In 2014, Tom Cross won the Oscar for Best Editing. He went on to edit Joy... The world doesn't owe you a thing. 2016's multi-academy award-winning hit La La Land. You either follow my rules or follow my rules. And most recently, First Man. There are risks, but we have every intention of coming back. What many people probably don't know about Tom is that prior to Whiplash, he was working primarily as an assistant and as a music video editor. Whiplash was by far the biggest project he had worked on at the time. Sometimes one can turn from an assistant into an A-list editor when opportunity meets skill and passion. This is Coffee with Editors. Welcome to this uh, episode of Drinking Coffee with Editors. So Aaron, how did we meet? I reached out to you because I really like your YouTube channel. And our conversation sort of immediately went into movies and specifically yeah. to Whiplash. Whiplash is the story of an aspiring young jazz drummer. While in attendance at a prestigious music conservatory, his abilities and ambition are tested to the absolute limit by his demanding and often abusive mentor, who is determined to either make Andrew great or destroy him. I love this movie and I actually, when I'm teaching at a college, I use a scene in there as an example of really interesting editing. And I thought we should really like dig into this movie and yes. figure out why this is potentially a real classic, like maybe one of the most significant movies about editing in the past 10 years. Well, let's start at the beginning. Like how did For this sure. movie come about? The director, Damien Chazelle, was, at the time, just a, um, like a ghostwriter. I wrote the script pretty quickly on my own and then just kind of put it in a drawer and didn't really know what to do with it. And when I finally started showing it to people, I mean, it was this sort of obvious challenge of convincing people that a movie about a jazz drummer could have any uh, sort of broader appeal. How do you know it wins in a music competition? Isn't it subjective? No. And so the idea was to do a short for me to prove myself as a director. Well, we should take a look at really the editing of the short versus the editing of the yeah. feature and mm -hmm. see if they just shot it shot by shot or if they like evolved on the storytelling. I saw the feature first like most people. The camera setups are mostly the same. Mm -hmm. All the focal lengths are like pretty much the same. Most of the actors are the same. They've lifted shots from the short film, several. I mean, there's a couple that you can just look at and like, they just color graded it, that's all they did. There's a line where he says, I'm gonna gut you like a pig, mm -hmm. in the script. Mm -hmm. When they were shooting the short, he said, I'm I will fuck you like a pig. He wouldn't do that line reading again, but Tom Cross, the editor, they just lifted it right out of the Short film. I will fuck you like a pig. Now, are you a rusher or are you a dragger or are you gonna be on my fucking time? I'm gonna be on your time. Miles Teller coming in as the new counterpart because in the short film it's a completely different actor. The dynamic changes. Tom Cross, the editor of the film, said that they tried to cut the feature exactly like the short, but with different actors and different performances, they found that it didn't have the same rhythm and soul and that the feature film would require a different approach in the editing room. With Miles, he's just, uh, you know, such a, a good combination of uh, 
you know, a trained actor, but uh, but a guy who lives in the moment and, and can be very spontaneous, both in terms of what he's giving and what and how he's responding. In the script and in the editing is reflected really nicely, sort of just like a really basic filmmaking principle, which is just to always keep escalating things, escalating things, escalating things. Yeah. A lot of people will visualize this sort of concept as like a graph moving up, you know, like this, where there's like, you know, it comes up to the climax and then there's a little denouement right afterwards and then the next scene is up a little bit. Yikes, I am doing a horrible job of explaining this here. So let me give you an outline of the scene and try and show you what I'm talking about. The sequence starts with Andrew waking up late for his class because he was out late on a date. This causes tension to rise, but when he gets to class, no one is there, more tension. When he checks the room schedule though, he realizes that he's actually early and that class doesn't start for a while creating a downbeat or a release of tension. Then, the band files in and tension rises again. The first string drummer asks him to tune the yeah, kit. I'm uh, Andrew Name. Tune the set to B-flat, then you turn my pages during rehearsal. Rising tension. Then, Fletcher enters the room and the tension reaches a new high before he addresses Andrew. We got a squeaker today, people. Neiman, 19 years old, isn't he cute? And creates a small release. And I think that downbeat is really important for great storytelling. Yes, you need to keep rising and rising and rising, yeah. but having these moments of recovery before you rise makes this, this dynamic range even more extreme, and it, yeah. it takes the audience on a bigger ride. Then, Fletcher humiliates a student for being out of tune and sharply escalates the scene. Do you think you're out of tune? Yes. Then why the didn't you say so? Later, during the break, Fletcher corners Andrew. And after what just happened, we fear for Andrew, but the scene turns again. You're here for a reason. You believe that, right? Yeah. Release. Then, back in class, Fletcher praises Andrew for his playing. We got Buddy Rich here. Which is really just a setup to contrast the rest of the scene, which climaxes in this. You are a worthless, friendless, faggot lip little piece of shit whose mommy left daddy when she figured out he wasn't Eugene O'Neill and who is now weeping and slobbering all over my drum set like a fucking nine-year-old girl. So we can see, by plotting out the escalation of the scene through ascending turns of tension and relaxation, the way that the scene's structure pulls us deeper and deeper into the emotions and relationship dynamics of the characters. <laughs> He's asking him a couple of times during the scene. Were you rushing or were you dragging? Yeah. Do you think the audience knows? I, I don't know. The truth of the moment is... Before we reveal if Andrew is actually on time or not, I want to take a brief moment to thank Skillshare for their support. It's an online learning community with thousands of classes in filmmaking, editing, writing, design, business, tech, and more. I came across a cool tutorial on blogging by Sarah Dietschy. Sarah is an authority on YouTube, and I'm a long-term subscriber of hers. So I was happy to see her break down her filmmaking process. Typically, people associate this with vlogging. It's basically picking up maybe a small camera and walking around and filming yourself, but it's so much more than that. In this 30-minute tutorial, she takes you from camera work, storytelling, editing, to publishing on YouTube. If you want to get into that game, and any aspiring filmmaker should, I do recommend checking out her course, so the first 500 viewers who sign up get a two months free trial. Now back to Whiplash, and let's find out if Andrew's drumming was right on time. The truth of the moment is, is that at first he's totally on time. Mm-hmm. Fletcher just does it to fuck with him. You're rushing. Here we go. Uh, ready? Okay. Five, six, and. Dragging just a hair. Wait for my cue. Five, six, seven. I think the scene is about him proving a point to him is that you think that you know and you think that you have this confidence but I'll show you how easily I will throw the confidence off. Because in the beginning of the scene, he sort of illustrates this point where he says, somebody's out of tune. We have an out of tune player here. Then says that it was one guy and ejects him from his classroom. Yeah. Why are you still sitting there? Get the fuck out! And then once he's out, he says, For the record, Mets wasn't out of tune. You were Erickson, but he didn't know. 
and that's bad enough. So it's really interesting that they actually created a sub-layer to this premise. There's a deeper motivation there than what on the surface is being played out. It's kind of a fight scene. Damien always wanted to make an action movie first, an action thriller first, and a music movie second. He said he wanted the musical scenes to feel like the boxing scenes from Raging Bull. Can you even fucking read music? What is that? Yes, what is that? Sight read measure 101. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Ba -ba -ba. What are you, a fucking acapella group? Play the goddamn kit! Now answer my question. Were you rushing or were you dragging? Jump cuts, smash cuts, jumping the line intentionally, yeah. you know, all of these kind of techniques that are used to disorient sort of the mm. viewer and give it, you know, a violent yeah. sort of tonality. As an aspiring editor, what are the things that you should be watching for when you see this film for the first time or when you're gonna watch it again, now knowing that this is the most important film about editing in the past 10 years? Yeah, I mean, I would say for the first run through, like, don't watch for anything. Okay. Just like, let it, ha let it work on you the way yeah. that it's gonna work on you. That's a general rule, I think, for any film. Yeah. I never watch a film and start analyzing it. It's really worthwhile to like read the script and compare that, you know, sit there with the script in hand while you kind of go back and forth and see some of the choices that were made. I think that honestly to glean anything new that you can't just like read in any textbook about editing, you have to get into the like the scene by scene level and break down like when you get to a cut, stop at that cut and you play it back like five times, you're like, why did they cut there? How is this cut motivated? Your analysis isn't gonna be necessarily right. I mean, you're really just guessing, but if you do it as an exercise, you're building up sort of like a catalog in your head of if it makes sense to you, right? And it's a tool that is, you think is working in a certain way, then it's something that you can use in your own editing and that when you come into a similar scenario where you have a goal in mind and you think that it was accomplished well, like steal it. <laughs> if you want to steal some more editing goodies, my podcast buddy Tyler and I take an even closer look at the Not My Tempo scene. Feel like he's not. I'm focused on so many other things. <laughs> yeah. I will fuck you like a pig. Yeah, we're, we're super tight now. Nothing else matters, just the two of them. Or are you going to be on my fucking time? And if you want to take a deep dive into scene editing, you can virtually hang out in my editing bay as I'm cutting my latest feature film project. Each episode episode is an editing session of a scene based around a specific concept or technique. So I want to withhold showing what is going on over there as long as possible, building suspense. So shadow me over on Patreon, ask questions and give feedback on the progress. All right, gang. Whiplash. Really happy that you came by. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's fun. Thank you for having me. Um, so this is like kind of an experiment, coffee with editors. <laughs> Let us know if you think this is interesting, if this is something you'd like to see more of. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you so much for Thank coming. You, and see you guys on the next one. Cheers. <laughs>